so let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Grand with the City of Palo Alto. Excited to host this class tonight. Going to go over a couple introductory information, and then we'll have Lori teach the class. I know we're all pretty comfortable with Zoom, but this webinar is going to be recorded and made available on the Bosco website. We'll be sending up a follow-up email with links to a survey about other classes you'll want to see and a link to the recording. You can ask questions in two ways, by putting it in the Q&A box or at the end of the webinar, we'll also have an opportunity for you to raise your hand and ask our instructor directly your question. We are gonna do most of the Q&A for the end of the class, but feel free to type it in as the class goes. And if there's something super timely, we'll, we'll bring it up during. A little background about Bosco. So Bosco represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, a water company, and a university, all that purchase water from San Francisco. Bosco member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people. And Bosco's goal is a high quality supply of water at a fair price. Outdoor water use represents the single largest untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bosco service area. We hold these classes to promote the use of water efficient plants and innovative technologies to help conserve water. So a little bit of background about some rebates here in Palo Alto. So we partner with Valley Water for all of our landscape rebates. You can get a rebate of up to $4 per square foot for converting your grass to drought tolerant plants. We have rebates for rain barrels, cisterns, a gray water laundry systems, irrigation upgrades, and more. All of this information can be found at our cityofpaloalto.org slash ways to save page. In addition, we recently launched Water Smart. This is an online portal where you can log in and see your monthly water use, get personalized efficiency tips and recommendations. You might see in the, your email getting a monthly water use report, showing how you're doing. This is a great resource for you to better understand your water usage patterns. In addition, we offer free mulch from Hopkins Tennis Courts and Mitchell Park. And we also have a compost giveaway station at Eleanor Party Community Garden. And I think we'll be learning a little bit more about the importance of mulch and compost tonight. Now, if you're not in Palo Alto, but part of the Bosca service agency, um, part of an agency within Bosca, Bosca has several similar rebates. So they have a lawn be gone rebate of one to four dollars per square foot for converting lawn with drought tolerant plants. They have a 200 up to $200 rebate for rain barrels. Um, they have a smart controller rebate and an optional rain garden rebate. And all that information can be found at bayareaconservation.org. Valley Water has some additional resources and, video and FAQ videos on how to set up your irrigation, how to go about converting your lawn. And then this is actually the last class that Palo Alto is hosting, but Bosca has several other classes coming up in, in the month of November. So please join Bosca to learn on even more topics of how to save water at home. And then uh, lastly, some great resources at bayareagardening.org. So some good resources and guides on this website. I see a question about the rain barrel rebate. It is per rain barrel. So if you do multiple rain barrels, you can get a rebate for each one. Um, I, I think it's for the cost of the barrel. I'm not sure if it includes the fittings for, for combining them. My, my understanding is it's just the, the barrel itself. We had, that's the question. Um, but happy to provide you with the, the link for more information on that program as well. All right. So I am excited to introduce our instructor. 
So Lori Caldwell is an Alameda County Master Composter, a Bay-Friendly Certified Landscape Professional, and Self-Taught Edible Gardener. She recently received a technical certification from the Maine Compost School. Um, her mission is to connect people to the soil and all that it provides. She has been happily teaching sustainable gardening classes since 2007. And Lori, I'll let you take it away. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, like Linda said, yes. Um, my name is Lori. I am here to talk to you about uh, uh, water-wise gardening, specifically for edibles. I am a big edible gardener. Um, this picture here is my garden uh, last year, my last year fall garden. And so, yeah, I'm happy to talk to you about all the tips and tricks. So please feel free to put uh, your questions uh, in the Q&A. Thank you so much for coming today. All right. So what water-wise gardening is really about is basically making your water work its best in your landscape, uh, increasing the water holding capacity of your soil, um, uh, building healthy soil, which definitely comes along with that. We will totally talk about that. Um, things like capturing rainwater or using recycled water um, in order just to, you know, take advantage of all of the things, that, all that water that comes onto your property, try to make it stay onto your property. And then, of course, uh, irrigation techniques um, that's going to max maximize things like efficiency. So, so the things we are going to talk about this evening, um, all the tools um, for building healthy soil, and I'm using that with edibles. Um, I've also included um, included perennials, and some people might think that might be a weird thing to add in a water wise um, workshop, but we'll get to that. And then uh, the different ways of recycling water, and we're going to be talking about drip irrigation, uh, rainwater, and gray water as well. So the first thing, of course, I want to talk about is compost. Compost is definitely my thing. Compost is going to be the key to a very successful garden in a variety of different ways. Um, mostly compost, what we call basic compost, something that's most likely been made out of um, food scraps, maybe yard waste, uh, you know, fresh trimmings, bark of trees, that sort of thing. Uh, it's a soil amendment. So it's going to hold uh, water in the soil a lot longer than without, which is something we definitely need. If you are contending with a problematic soil type, maybe something like clay or, or even sand, um, uh, compost is going to definitely help uh, with that process by um, aerating the soil, at least the clay soil. So it allows for more drainage, uh, for more nutrition to pass down, as well as the roots of anything you're going to plant. Uh, to be able to work its way down in through the clay soil. If you have sandy soil, um, sandy soil drains very quickly, drains a lot of nutrition as well as moisture. So um, adding compost to a sandy uh, soil situation uh, is going to help those particles clump together so they can hold on to water uh, definitely uh, for a lot longer, as well as keeping moisture levels kind of on a nice little even keel, which is super important as well as keeping the temperature uh, on an even keel. And that lends itself primarily to uh, to plant health. A plant that has to go through wet and dry or hot and cold situations um, has a tendency to get stressed out and a stressed out plant is gonna be preyed upon by any pest uh, in the neighborhood, pretty much. So like I said, it can hold its own weight and moisture, which is great. And generally uh, the applications are usually uh, top dressing, which is when you're preparing a new site for planting, just putting about one to two inches of compost right on top, just kind of roughly working it into the soil. When you water, it'll percolate down into the soil, which is nice. And then applying compost uh, primarily around the the um, the base of existing plants. Uh, that's called side dressing. And that's a great application as well. If you are growing food in containers, uh, maintaining the nutrition and fertility of the soil is going to be super key and uh, compost is going to be really key um, to making that happen as well. Excuse me. 
<clears throat> allergy season. Worm castings. It's a different type of compost. Um, made primarily of things like food scraps in an enclosed container. It's great for folks who don't have a lot of yard waste, but they want to be able to compost. Um, and maybe you live in an apartment. Maybe you just don't have any trees um, or you're a unable to get the, the right amount of stuff that you need to do basic composting. So worm castings are a great option. Uh, unlike the basic compost, which is more of a soil amendment, worm castings are we're going to treat more like a fertilizer. They're very potent. They are um, very high in nitrogen. So if you're growing food, it's, um, it contains a lot of nitrogen and a lot of uh, beneficial microorganisms. So when you add it to the soil, not only is it taking care of um, making sure that the soil has uh, nitrogen, of course, which is one of the primary uh, uh, nutritional elements in, in, in plant growth, and plant fertility, pardon me. And the, um, the beneficial microbes in your soil are going to be there to kind of cut out any kind of pests or any kind of diseases just pretty much from the get-go, which is a great option as well. And it's also great to uh, utilize, uh, start seeds with. Um, I always like to implement castings as part of when I transplant my new plants, they generally will get a uh, liquid form of the castings and it works really, really great. Also great for house plants as well, but we're talking about edibles, so. And then of course there's mulch. Uh, coarse mulch for uh, uh, perennials, uh, that being something like a woody, uh, a woody tree, fruit tree, something like that. Uh, mulch is going to be a great course. Uh, I personally like a good two to three inch pieces per when I'm looking at uh, purchasing mulch. Um, you also do have the option of um, uh, getting mulch for free, either by an arborist. I usually go with smaller companies. Uh, chances are they're going to have uh, smaller trucks. So for that, I might expect anywhere from about five to 10 cubic yards of mulch from something like that. If you go to like a bigger operation, like a Davy tree service where they have much larger trucks, um, you're looking at at least a minimum of 20 cubic yards. So depending on how much you want to mulch or how much area you have to mulch, it's always a good option to try that. I've heard really good success with chip drop as well. Uh, generally, there's a bit of a waiting list when it comes to arborist mulch, so that's something that needs to be taken into consideration if you're on some sort of deadline or you just want to finish up the project. But you do also have the option of purchasing mulch, of course. Um, some of the great options they have out there is recycled content mulch, which is generally sometimes it's arbor mulch and then they dye it uh, specific colors, or they're doing a lot of great things with um, chipped up uh, untreated pallets. Um, like the one, the picture that you see on the left. It's a brown chip. They usually dye them in different colors. I would steer folks away from the black dyed mulch, primarily because it's over time, it is definitely going to fade for sure. And then usually when it's around a lot of plants, it really holds on to the heat and really just pushes the heat back up and into your plants. So sometimes you'll experience... Um, you know, brown leaves on the bottom of your plants. It's too hot. I always tell everybody it's like um, wearing a wool turtleneck sweater in Livermore in the middle of August. It's kind of like that. But you also have a, a lot of options. I would, like I said, I always try for the piece size. About two to three inches really makes for a really good, a uh, really good coverage when it comes to when it comes to mulching and I uh some of the benefits of mulching are many um they it does it will eventually break down and build up that healthy soil just like it will with compost as well as it's going to help suppress weeds and uh its ability to hold on to moisture which is great and again it like compost is going to lend itself to keeping the soil um, at a specific moisture level and a specific temperature level as well And then there's fine mulch. Specifically, I like a good fine mulch for uh, my annual edibles, most likely, you know, like some fleshy, uh, fleshy kind of plants. 
Uh, pine needles, I would definitely break them up a little bit. Uh, one to two inches for this mostly. While mulch is great and it does have good water holding capabilities, you don't want, especially annuals, you definitely don't want them to have too, too much, uh, too much water on that. Straw is usually the traditional thing. Uh, and then leaves as well. Even though leaves are great just to kind of to be left underneath the tree that they fall. Or put them in your compost, of course. <clears throat> now, hydrozoning is another key element when it comes to water-wise gardening. It's grouping your plants by their water needs. Also, I always take into consideration whether or not um, it's sun and shade needs as well. So uh, the example I have listed here are, are you know, planting uh, perennial herbs, say like a rosemary, next to maybe like another woody pollinator plant, um, or even just another pollinator plant in general. They both have the same relative requirements. Most uh, woody perennial herbs have a tendency to be really drought tolerant. So I'm going to take that into consideration and I'm going to plant those together. I'm not going to put my rosemary and my tomato plant next to each other, they have completely different requirements. If I water for the tomato plants, then I may overwater my rosemary. But of course, if I water for my rosemary, it's going to be not enough water for my tomatoes. So in order to keep your plants nice and healthy and alive, and you know, especially if you're going out by plants, they're not always cheap. You want to them to be um to stay on your in your landscape as long as possible. Um smart controllers help with this as well. So um, doing hydrozoning, you can do that very easily with a smart controller by, you know, controlling, you know, my, this is where my fruit trees are and they have a specific time and uh, amount that has to, that has to be required for them to water, which is going to be definitely a lot higher than say maybe things like your tomatoes would be. So maybe your annuals are all together and they're all grouped into one kind of zone uh, for a certain amount of time. And then you're going to have some, maybe some drought tolerant plants, uh, your per, uh, perennial woody herbs. I'm always a big proponent of, regardless of the fact that you're growing food, you're always going to want to grow something that's going to attract pollinators or beneficial insects. Generally, that's a lot of our California natives. And generally, those are usually uh, drought tolerant as well. So I'm going to incorporate all my drought tolerant ones uh, together as well. And then when it comes to irrigation controllers, it really just runs the gamut. To be honest, you can nerd out as much as you possibly want. There's soil probes and there's GPS and all different types of things um, that you can utilize to kind of maximize the efficiency of your water. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of um, irrigation controllers that have a uh, seasonal adjustment feature on it. So the way it works is nothing really changes the, except for the amount of water that comes out of your irrigation. So the dates are the same, the days of the week, the times are all the same, and even the duration is even the same. So you can find yourself as we are now kind of working our way out of, um, out of our course, out of summer into fall into our winter, that now I'm not going to have to irrigate as much, but I still wanted to come on at a certain amount of time. So I can use the seasonal adjustment to turn down the amount of water that my plant gets. You know, middle of the summer, it's going 100%. But as I move closer, closer and even closer just to even turning my irrigation off in the wintertime, um, it's always going to be nice to be able to adjust that. So seasonal adjustment is a great option as well. So when we're talking about uh, edible planting and we're talking about <clears throat> row culture, I'm always interested in letting people know about the biointensive method. It's been around for as long as we stopped moving and started propagating. And the, the main thing about it is it's going to increase your yields because you're going to be able to plant your plants a lot closer together just to kind of get out of the the mindset of uh of the uh, the row culture when these plants are planted together a lot closely they have the ability to kind of create their own living mulch it keeps the the soil a little bit cooler to help um with moisture of course and with weed suppression 
And then you can put a lot more in in a much smaller space as well. And then there's other things that come along with it, basically closing the loop. And if you're ever interested, there is a gentleman, his name is John Jevons, and he teaches a um, lovely workshop outside of Willits um, here in Nor um, up in Northern California um, that really focuses on it. And it's great for the small farm, for the big farm, for any kind of thing. So I have a great little visual. So on the left is your traditional kind of row culture. Uh, and on the right is more of the, the biointensive where they kind of plant things, uh, what's known as off center. Also things like interplanting is another really big key uh, with biointensive. So uh, in the garden on the right, so say it was a, say it was a spring garden uh, and I was doing tomatoes. Some of these uh, dots would be tomatoes. Some of these dots might be basil. Some of these dots might be carrots. And I can interplant them all together and plant them amongst each other for mutual, mutual benefit to, of course, to maximize my yields and utilize the amount of space that I have. But also uh, it comes to things like companion planting. So planting that basil is going to keep something away from my tomato or my carrot. So interplanting all those things together and growing them relatively close together. Now, if you're doing this um, with containers or even if you're just doing this in the ground, keeping the soil healthy, making sure that your plants have all the nutrition that they that they need are also going to be super key when it comes to, um, to planting that, especially planting densely. Now, I want to talk about adding uh perennials to your garden. And I know we're talking about water wise and I know everyone's first thoughts possibly could be, well, perennials don't seem to be very water wise. And a lot of people may have come to this workshop thinking, well, edibles themselves aren't that really water wise. And some people can think that they are very water intensive. Um, definitely not as intensive, I would say, as grass. Um, but with the building healthy soil techniques, um, you're going to be able to maximize and make that water last a lot longer and work a lot harder in your garden. So perennials, uh, not only is it um, potentially water-wise well, um, but it's actually another great um, building healthy soil technique. So they're definitely a lot more productive than annuals, that's for sure. You plant them once, and then depending on the type of the plant, you can expect to, you know, to get decades of fruits or whatever else that you happen to be growing um, with that perennial, since we're specifically talking about edibles. Fruit trees, vines, um, herbaceous um, perennials as well. Um, the roots, they enable the structure, the soil structure. This is where when it comes to building healthy soil. Also, when you're planting uh, perennials in close proximity to annuals, you get the benefit because perennials have a tendency, their tap root goes way deeper into the soil than most annuals do. Um, so they're able to access water in the deeper um, regions of the soil, as well as very important trace elements that we have to provide on the top level because they exist so low down in the soil. Things like magnesium and iron, um, calcium, um, the perennials are able to pull those resources up from deep in the soil, and then the annuals close by are able to take advantage of that as well. And then they're generally hardier. They're going to be able to handle um, a lot major extremes as well. So I think in the long run, especially if your ultimate goal is to uh, is to grow food and to provide food um, for you for whoever you know for your home or if you're going to be donating it it's always going to be key to kind of have those hardy perennials in there. Perennials are always going to be the key to any kind of edible garden. And, you know, berries, fruit trees, artichokes, herbs. There's a lot of, um, a lot of things to choose from. Now, in order to kind of really make this the best of the water wiseness of this, it's going to be important to pick the time and the place um, to plant these perennials. Fall and winter are going to be the best time to add any perennials to your existing landscape, um, with the idea being that the winter rains are going to help them get established to 
force that taproot lower into the soil. So when the the hotter weather comes, they're going to be a little bit more prepared to handle. Not the same like in the first couple of years. Um, they're always going to need some sort of substantial kind of summer watering, but hopefully not as much if you're going to able to get them established um, in the fall and the winter for sure. Uh, I'm going to, of course, want to dig a hole and then I'm going to take that soil. I'm going to mix it about uh, one third with compost and then I'm going to backfill it and put the um, put the plant back into the hole and um, and then fill that up with my amended soil. I'm not going to want to put compost right on the bottom, put compost right on the bottom and the perennial has no reason to literally branch out its roots. This way it's all mixed into the soil and now not only are you getting the tap root to go, but all those kind of fibrous roots um, to work their way out. Um, when you're working with clay soil and you're planting, especially things like fruit trees, um, my best recommendation would be to you is to prep the hole a day or a couple days before. Um, you know, sometimes you might have to give it a little bit of water to loosen up the soil a little bit um, and dig, you know, an appropriate size hole. And then I'm going to fill that up with water and then I'm going to um, wait for that to drain. Um, I want to make sure that you know that it's poor. Sometimes with clay soil, Sometimes it has a tendency to not allow water or anything to kind of pass through. If you've ever seen, I mean, I've seen, you know, very old avocado trees, but only very short in the soil where it's not really, it's only getting a little bit of water from the direct right there at the root. Because sometimes with clay, it becomes kind of hydrophobic. So by kind of flooding it with water and allowing it to drain, it'll probably take all day just as a heads up, especially for clay soil. So, you know, do it in the morning and then figure you're going to do maybe planting maybe the next the next morning. Um, also, because it, sometimes it does have a tendency to be hydrophobic, I'm going to want to score the sides a little bit just so I can kind of break it up a little bit. I want water and nutrition and the roots to be able to pass through this barrier a lot easier for that. Now, when it comes to drip irrigation, especially when we're talking about fruit trees, um, you always want them to kind of go to the drip line, basically where the canopy ends, where the canopy ends, that's how far out you want the irrigation to go, because that's where all the roots are as well. And so you want to go out with the drip line, you're going to want to do things like compost and mulch um, out to the drip line as well. You want to be able to not only just do what is perceived to be the root ball, but the entire kind of system, you want to do that. And if you sheet mulch, which I'm going to talk about next, um, that's a great way to um, to kind of just get that already covered. <clears throat> when you do use mulch, just be careful uh, about putting it around the, the very base of your trees. You're going to want to allow um, some space. Usually, if that space is usually occupied either with your soil or, or compost, um, for a couple of reasons, uh, especially things like fruit trees, like citrus trees, you're going to have to um, give them a lot of nitrogen uh, pretty often. So you're going to want that space to be free and not have to be mulch. Again, because mulch does have great water holding capabilities, too close to the trunk of your tree could be problematic for the for the tree. We're definitely trying to avoid that. Um, when it comes to fruit trees, uh, bare root tree season is going to be coming up starting probably end of December um, into early January, early February. So that's always a great time to get not only uh, bare root, um, it's a, it's a much of a, a smaller price, which is nice. Sometimes, depending on the tree that you're trying to get, sometimes you have to get a second tree if there's not already another tree that's similar um, in your neighborhood or already on your property. So that's always a good cost cutter. Um, then you also have the option of buying trees that are espalier, um, and then they're usually grafted, or you can buy different types of grafted trees as well. If you don't have a lot of room for multiple trees, um, grafted trees that are, you know, similar, they're all apples, or maybe one's a plum, and then and ungrafted on it, it's a pluot or an aprum, something as long as it's all genetically uh, the same. You can maximize the space that you have and um, only have to commit to one tree.
So sheet mulching. It's cardboard, compost, and mulch. And this is, if you're, especially if you're doing like a food forest or you're putting in a fair amount of perennials or pollinator plants, uh, sheet mulching is definitely the way to go. And like Linda said, there is a rebate that's going to be involved with that. I would definitely take advantage of that. Um, that's free money to be had. Um, like anything else that I talked about this evening uh, with sheet mulching or with compost and mulch, both of which part of the sheet mulch process, uh, we're really talking about promoting healthy soil and plants. Um, sheet mulching is great for unused areas. So if there's an area that you're not really sure what to do with, but you would like to keep the soil in place, especially if we end up getting rains like we did last year. Uh, sheet mulching is a great way to kind of keep soil there instead of having it run off and go into our waterways. That becomes problematic for the waterways and for the um, organisms that live in there. So, uh, and then, like I said, if you're not really interested in really planting anything, why not just sheet mulch over it? It creates like a beautiful kind of blank canvas from which to work with. However, if you already have existing plants, you can sheet mulch around them with great success. Um, eventually it's going to save you money, water, and time, especially if you are um, transitioning from an existing lawn to something like a more of a food forest, definitely. Um, weed suppression, cardboard is going to be our weed blocker. It is permeable. So it will allow for moisture and for nutrition to pass along with it, but still be weed suppressant. Um, I'm a huge proponent of it because I've seen a lot of really great soil on top of landscape fabric, you know, nice and crumbly, beautiful, everything. But then you, as soon as you pull away the landscape fabric, you see a lot of just gray, especially for clay soil, just gray, white roots with no nutrition, nothing really to it. So a permeable barrier is going to be more uh, beneficial to building healthy soil for that. Uh, protecting the environment, especially if you're able to pull things kind of out of the waste stream, like recycled cardboard boxes, or you get free mulch from uh, from an arborist. Uh, and then with the addition of compost um, into your landscape, when you do use compost in your landscape, you're doing a lot of things um, to help fight uh, global climate change. Uh, soil has the ability to capture that carbon and hold it into the soil um, indefinitely, as long as the soil is undisturbed. So by adding it, and if you're sheet mulching a very large area, and you're probably going to be using about two inches of compost in order to do the sheet mulch project, um, you can expect to sequester a significant amount of carbon um, in your soil for a very long period of time, especially if the soil, again, has been undisturbed. So our first layer is going to be um, cardboard. You can purchase rolled cardboard. It's known as beef loot. Um, the price ranges and it's become a little bit more difficult to uh, to find. I'm sure I think in the South Bay, they I, I've seen a couple of places. Um, San Jose, um, I'm not sure if they have them in uh, what is uh, for Palo Alto, but but personally, I am a huge proponent of recycled cardboard, cardboard boxes. Amazon Prime boxes. Uh, the box in the picture is a bicycle box. Those are the Cadillac of cardboard boxes. Um, they're probably about three boxes thick. Um, each box is roughly around six feet, and that's when it's closed. So when you open it, you get a lovely 12 feet of cardboard to cover uh, a, significant, uh, a significant area. And then when you're thinking about when you're doing it, you want to make sure that when you put the cardboard down, especially cardboard boxes, you want to make sure you overlap about six to eight inches and recycled cardboard is great for that because that automatically has those gaps. Um, so you're able to really kind of cover those gaps. Uh, our next layer is going to be compost, about one and a half to two inches right on top. Again, it holds its own weight and moisture. So that's uh, super perfect. Building up that healthy soil. And then when you're planting, uh, if you're going to be planting or if you're already putting it around in the existing plantings, uh, that compost um, is going to feed that those feed those additional plantings as well. And then to top it off, 
about three inches of a coarse mulch to put that on top. And then um, again, making sure that you don't um, get too close to the base of your trees. It's going to become a great sponge and not allow for you know, uh, not allow for too much evaporation. Again, keeping the temperature and the moisture of your soil at a nice little even keel. And again, all this material is organic in nature and it will eventually break down. So generally when it comes to sheet mulching, the, the general maintenance for that is mostly just when you discover um, that either the mulch or the cardboard is broken down, you're just gonna move aside that old mulch, just patch with a piece of cardboard, put the old mulch on top and then put some new mulch on top of that. Super easy. Now, when you first, of course, when the first thing I, you should do is, of course, apply for the rebate program, um, wait for them to give you the okay to do it, and then you can go ahead and move ahead. Um, I always like to, there's a little bit of prep if you're doing something, <clears throat> so you're getting rid of a lawn or an area, especially if you're going to be doing trenching along the hardscape edges, um, you're going to want to contact 811 for sure. 811, I usually go to the website. Um, and then, you know, do a ticket, just let them know that you're going to be trenching, or if you're going to be putting in significant larger trees, things that come in by five gallons or larger, you're definitely going to want to make sure you put that in prior to sheet mulching. And then when you do do that, um, it's always going to be super key that you make sure that you plant it slightly above the soil level, because you're eventually going to add those sheet mulch layers on top of it. And you don't want to, uh, you definitely want to avoid kind of a bowl situation. If you're planting a pollinator plant or something for beneficial insects, you might be uh, more inclined to plant it uh, slightly mounded. So it's a little bit higher in the soil, even after uh, you sheet mulch it. Most drought tolerant plants don't um, like to get their feet wet. So mounding and creating some uh, drainage for them is going to be super key. And then... Uh, capping and uh, your irrigation, your existing irrigation in your lawn, um, and converting it to drip irrigation. Talked about planting those five gallons or larger. Um, if there are weeds that you're trying to get rid of, just chop it down. If you already have an existing lawn, I, you do not have to rip the lawn out. You can just go ahead and sheet mulch right over top of it. And um, what's going to happen is basically it's going to compost your lawn into place. And then when it all starts to break down, all that nitrogen that your lawn took from the soil uh, and that you gave it is going to um, work its way back into the soil. Uh, and it's going to help feed anything that you're going to be planting, which is nice. Now, if you're going to be, um, your project is somewhere near a hardscape, so your sidewalk or driveway, walkway, um, sometimes utility boxes, all different types of things people might have in their landscape. It's going to be super important to uh, make sure that you trench along those hardscape edges, just so the fact that when it comes to stacking that material, if I haven't trenched, then it's going to be uh, cardboard, compost, and mulch. Unfortunately, it's just going to spill right onto my, say, my sidewalk. Definitely want to avoid that. I want to go at least a foot wide. The spade shovel is great measurement for that. But three to six inches down and at about a 45 degree angle. I'm saying the 45 degree angle because I'm going to be bending the cardboard down into the trench. I need that slope. I know uh, initially you think a 90 degree angle might be the way to go. But then that just becomes a stuck at elbow and there's no mulch and compost is going to want to sit on that. So that 45 degree angle is going to be super key. So when it comes to cardboard compost and mulch, either it's slightly below the hardscape or it's going to be even with the hardscape, which is definitely one of the key things to do. Now, when you're trenching, um, you're going to have all these lovely little clots of soil and grass. Um, I always say it's always going to be best to try to incorporate some visual interest or if you're, like I said, if you're planting uh, drought tolerant plants um, to kind of create mounds just for visual interest. Or if you're not into that, then just lay it evenly on your property 
and then sheet mulch over top of it. Because unfortunately, because it is soil, it doesn't qualify to go into your green cart or your organics cart. It would have to go in your landfill cart. And that would take probably weeks and weeks to do. So why not? <clears throat> why not do that? Just an example of the trenching and how sometimes you can bend the cardboard down into the trench. Especially if you're trying to kill something kind of nasty underneath there, like an ivy or even a Bermuda grass. It's always nice to make sure that that trenching is always going to be super key for that. Don't forget about pollinators and beneficial insects. <laughs> um, these are kind of my favorites. There's sweet alyssum that's on the right. I know it gets a real bum rap. Um, but the one thing that the sweet alyssum and the yarrow have in common is that multi-flowered kind of situation. Um, bees love it. Uh, butterflies do love it, as well as uh, beneficial insects. The plant on the left is my favorite. Uh, which is yarrow. It is a California native. It is drought tolerant. Um, the native comes in with a white bloom, but you can get cultivars of a variety of different colors. Um, it is also the host plant for at least five different types of beneficial insects, one of which I, I've showed you here, which is the juvenile uh, lady beetle, which is going to eat copious and copious amounts of um, sap sucking um, pests that most likely are going to come um, after your edibles, so. All right. So let's talk about recycling water, reusing water. Now, plants, especially perennials, they'll take all kinds of water. I mean, there've been times when I've watered plants with um, the water that I collect out of the shower, even if it's just a little bit soapy. Um, uh, you know, you're going to steam an artichoke or you're boiling pasta, or you have leftover coffee. Um, all of these things still totally qualify uh, in order to, to, to water your plants. And then, of course, there's options like, of course, like gray water, um, rainwater catchment. So first, we're going to talk about gray water. Specifically, the system that um, I always talk about that you don't have to <clears throat> have a permit for is the laundry to landscape system. I'm sorry, Linda, I was drinking tea when you were making your announcements. Does the city or Bosca, they do a laundry to landscape rebate? Yeah, Paulo also, we partner with Valley Water for a $400 rebate for a laundry system. Oh, wow, that's great. <clears throat> Does that for the whole system? Yeah, for any anyone putting it in, they can get up to $400. Wow, that's great. Um, so most gray water systems, the laundry the landscape system is the water that comes from your washing machine. Um, water um, that comes from your shower, uh, that's a different type of gray water system and that would actually have to be permitted. Usually there's some sort of pond or some sort of feature that comes along with it. But the water from the washing machine, that's water basically on demand. So, and the nice thing about laundry the landscape is, in the wintertime when it's, you know, obviously we don't need to be irrigating things, you do have the option of switching it over so the water does have the ability to go and be treated in the sewer, for sure. Uh, you do have to adjust your soaps to make sure that they're non-phosphate soaps, which is fine. Um, but sometimes those soaps make the pH a little bit alkaline in the water. So I always end up um, giving a little bit more acid to uh, by adding coffee grounds. Um, to kind of beef up the acidity. When it comes to edibles, they actually do like their soil slightly acidic. It makes it easier for them to uh, take up nutrients. And then, of course, there are acid-loving specific plants um, that do really well with a little bit more of acidic soil. Uh, I uh, Fruit trees, uh, specific things like citrus, and, of course, things like blueberries as well. Um, the thing about gray water is it cannot be stored on, like, rainwater, so it has to be used so like I said, basically, every time you, you do a load of laundry and you have that system, um, that water ends up getting pumped out to uh, most likely your perennials, your woody perennials, just making sure that the gray water um, is actually just touching the soil and not touching the, um, and touching the, the actual leaves 
of the plant. There's no gray water overhead spray. Generally, usually with gray water, especially if you're doing um, things like fruit trees, there is a kind of a whole kind of filtration system. The water will initially just might come out and might go into a mulch basin, um, usually with full with mulch and with, with compost, and then they're plant, planted in conjunction around trees, and the trees will be able to take advantage of that, um, as well as that mulch and compost kind of filters out anything. It's kind of its last opportunity to filter anything out because, you know, there's food particles and, you know, clothing particles and stuff like that. So um, the mulch basins act kind of as a, a biofilter and also just slow down the water, slow it, let it sink and let it spread. And then the roots of all the uh, adjoining trees will be able to take advantage of that. This is what the, the valve system looks like. Again, you can adjust it so it either goes straight out to gray water or uh, if it's raining or if there's something that you're washing, you're doing a bleach load or something, you can easily switch that to sewer and then that will go to sewer and not to your garden. So yeah, definitely check for those rebates for sure. Uh, rain barrels, rainwater harvesting. You really don't have to go fancy when it comes to rainwater. Um, if you can have an opportunity to collect it in any kind of thing that you you can. Uh, a lot of people like to do DIY, um, get a 30-gallon trash can with a lid, uh, invert the lid, cut a little hole, and then uh, at least cover the hole with some sort of kind of like fine mesh. Probably have to staple it or attach it somehow just to keep the leaves and bugs and stuff out of your water, but porous enough so water can can definitely pass through. And then just put it underneath a downspout, anywhere that water comes off of your roof. There's a lot of kind of calculations and stuff that you can do. And there's cisterns and all different types of things. But if you just want to keep it super simple, you know, five-gallon buckets or trash cans or, you know, go out and get your rain barrel. There's a rain barrel rebate program. Take advantage of that. Um, if you're concerned with, um, because you can store rainwater indefinitely, if you're concerned about mosquitoes breeding in that water, um, this is where the uh, mosquito dunks come into play. It's a bacteria, which its only goal is to kill any mosquito larvae in the water, but the water itself is still potable. I can still drink it. Um, my kids can play on it. I, animals, birds, um, I can, and of course, use it to water my plants as well. So it's a great way to do it. It comes with either kind of donut or sometimes it also comes uh, granular and you can find that at your local nursery or your local hardware store very easily. All right, drip irrigation. Again, I talked about the um, the smart controllers and the ability to do seasonal adjustment uh, generally, when you are transitioning from, especially if you're converting from regular sprinklers or regular sprinkler heads to drip irrigation, there's a couple of things that you need to do. First of all, you need to bring down the, the pressure of the water that's coming in, that's going to be coming into your drip irrigation, your typical shower sink water. It's going to be too much. You need to bring that down to probably about 25 to 30 pounds per square inch. So that's going to require putting a pressure regulator on whatever system you're going to be converting to drip irrigation. You can either do that at the valve. There's usually a pressure regulator and there's a filter that come along with it. Or <clears throat> if you're not handy, like myself, um, you can get a um, pop-up conversion kit. Uh, it looks similar to an actual sprinkler head. And basically, you just find the most appropriate place to, to put it when you want to convert to it. This way, you don't have to do it at the valve. You can do it right at the at the level, um, at the lawn level, so to speak. So say my, uh, my area slopes down towards the street. I'm most likely going to want to put my, my new sprinkler head up at the top. That way, water doesn't have to really kind of work and be pushed up. Again, I just have to go down to the main line, which generally is about half inch PVC. I'm going to um, unscrew the, the existing sprinkler head and I'm going to switch it out for my conversion kit. And then I'm going to add that in. Um, if it's got some threads, I usually add a little bit of Teflon tape along the clean threads 
Teflon tape the threads, and then I'm going to go ahead and screw it to the top. And then to the top of that, there is um, there's a, a function on there where it's going to give me an option of sending out two half inch uh, half inch tubes that come off of that. So to be honest, I really like this as an option, especially since I'm going to be most likely digging up that area anyway. And that way I can convert it without having to, you know, cut PVC and do a lot of stuff that I don't really want to do. Or I don't want to do and mess up and then have to redo. Let's, let's just be honest with it. <laughs> Drip irrigation. So you have, it runs the gamut. There are MP rotors. There are bubblers. There is inline tubing. Um, there's uh, larger ones. It's called Netafem. So if you wanted to do just a grid pattern, you could just do a grid pattern where it's going to do it evenly. In my garden, I just use... Uh, inline tubing. It's a uh, half inch tubing and it's a, um, the emitters um, are about what, six to six to 12 inches apart. You can get them in different lengths. And like I said, I just spiral it back. Um, you can see towards the bottom um, where the, the tube goes from brown to black. The black is a solid tube that comes off of a half inch tube. Um, that unfortunately you can't see in the picture. So the water that's only coming out is coming out of the brown tubing. And then if I wanted to, you know, if I wanted to incorporate a little bit more, I could cut out the end of that and then just put an emitter or something else on it as well. So it runs the gamut. My friend Chris, he taught me everything he knows about irrigation. He says, irrigation is basically just like grown up Legos, just making sure that everything is connected and nothing leaks. That's all you really have to go for. And he's right. So we talked about this briefly about converting pop-up sprinklers to drip irrigation. Um, definitely a uh, pressure regulator is going to be super key. If you don't put it on, you'll know. Because um, it'll literally, you know, blow your tubing um, out. And then you'll have kind of weird leaks. Um if you were sheet mulching, which of course I'm totally going to recommend, um, you're going to lay your emitter hoses um, on top of the compost layer, but underneath the mulch layer. So that water is going to be kind of protecting it. Also too, especially in the, in the middle of summer, that mulch layer and that compost layer is going to help protect um, the tubing itself, just for the fact that they really take a hard beating in the sun, that they're covered with mulch, um, they're going to be cooler, uh, as well as they're going to be protected from the direct sun as well. And then if you have questions, go to your local irrigation store. They always have really great um, workshops. There's a lot of um, information, a lot of PDFs on their website. Um, sometimes it's just a question of just taking a picture of your site, letting them know where all your sprinklers are and saying, I want to convert. I definitely want to convert. Um, also, too, you can also do drip irrigation if you're growing things in containers as well. I just have my stuff coming off of my hose bib in my backyard. And you can put a timer on it or however you want. All right. Great. We do have some questions. Um, I think this is a good one since we were just talking about drip irrigation. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about doing drip irrigation and the biointensive planting and how to successfully combine those two. Well, for that, I might just do more like a like a grid system. So say I had a <clears throat> a raised bed, you know, like three feet wide and let's just say five feet long. Um, if I knew I was going to do like deep planting, then probably what I would do is I would do the same setup as I have with the with the tubing, except instead I would um, I'm always going to want to start with it's going to come off at a, at a half an inch. And then once it gets into the bed, it's going to go down to a quarter of an inch. So the ends will be that blank. It'll be that black stuff. Because um, if I'm not going to be feeding anything over there, I wouldn't have to worry about that. So both ends are going to be blanks, which means they're going to have no holes and emitters. And then I would just run tubing um, in a grid pattern, you know, however wide that you want it to be leaving enough space for um for the plants and then I would probably use that. Great. We have a couple questions about mulch and compost. Awesome. Um, 
basic compost that has worms in it, the red wiggler worms, should that be used as mulch or fertilizer? So the the one that has the worm castings, because a, a bit, uh, okay, I guess, so the, so compost itself, basic compost, um, will have a little bit of worm castings in it, but it's not mostly worm castings. But if we're talking about worm castings, I'm going to use that as a fertilizer. I'm going to use my kind of granular basic compost as a soil amendment. And generally, the worm castings that you see when you purchase them, they are they do have a tendency to be a little bit more granular because they have to take out the moisture out of them in order to make them shelf stable. But the castings that you see I have are kind of really black and kind of sticky. So there's a really big distinction between the two of them. So castings, fertilizer, basic compost, soil amendment. Great. And then we have a question about arbor mulch from redwood trees that's laying under the sun. Ooh. Is that still good to use if it's been under the sun for a few years? Uh, redwood mulch? Yes. Oh, I mean, yeah, as long as it's not that gorilla hair stuff. Just don't use that stuff. But redwood mulch is the Cadillac of mulches. The Cadillac. It lasts a long time because it's used to being wet because it's a redwood. And I think it's beautiful. So if you can get, you know, redwood mulch, then definitely do. Just not the furry stuff, the stuff that looks like like coconut coir or hairy or stuff like that. That's like trying to sheet mulch with chamomile flowers <laughs> <laughs> great um thinking of sheet mulching is there do you have any is there any way to do sheet mulching and not and um if there's any concerns about fire safety is there any way to do it in a way to ensure that the the cardboard wouldn't cause any sort of high fire hazard if it's in a high fire possible zone well the nice thing about it is if you're already incorporating this as part of edibles <clears throat> then you're already going to be irrigating it for sure. So that's also uh, definitely a function. Um, also too, the, the pea size is going to be super key. So like I said, that two to three inches of like a chip is always a really great size. And if you go like three inches, um, one of my colleagues just went to a mulch fire test and um, she said the big stuff, the really thick stuff, like the big redwood chips, those catch fire relatively quickly. And the very, very small stuff, very small stuff, like the red, like the, they call it mini bark or whatever, that stuff has a tendency not only to catch on fire, but because it is so small, it's easily picked up by the wind on fire and then trans, it'd be able to transport um, the fire from, from where it originated to the rest of your, rest of your landscape. So that two to three inches, and making sure, the nice thing about it is, and mulch does hold a lot of water in a long period of time. Um, the part of the things they showed about it in the mulch test was it looked like it was about to catch fire. Uh, and then because it does hold a lot of water, it just kind of fizzed out at the end. So I would say that two to three inches makes a really good mat and does have a tendency to really hold onto water a lot longer for weeks and weeks, to be honest. So uh, if that's a concern, then I would say either... Um, try to, you know, uh, make sure that you, you keep your plants that you're growing there um, on a good irrigation schedule. Great. Um, and then <clears throat> we have a question about thinking of converting lawn to veg to high raised vegetable beds. A um, couple questions here from Raj about the depth of the soil, how high to make the bed. Um, if there's any certain like vegetables for each season um, and kind of a little bit more about like the fertilizer needs. I know that's a lot, but I guess maybe it's like high level when you're thinking of converting lawn to these vegetable gardens, kind of how to get started and how you would set up that type of bed and some, some key vegetables to include. Sure. So um, I, I mean, I'm definitely going to recommend, you know, sheet mulch, even if you're going to be incorporating things like annuals, um, you could still definitely sheet mulch. What I would still recommend is, um, anything from your raised beds, 
there's two things. Number one, um, I'm always going to want to put cardboard underneath it, regardless if I'm sheet mulching or not. Just to add as a, act as a weed blocker for sure. Um, if you're dealing with something like maybe clay soil, before I put down my um, my raised bed or even my cardboard, I might try to aerate the soil a little bit with like a pitchfork or a shovel, just so when I, you know, I don't want, because when you go to fill it with soil, the soil is all nice and fluffy. And so now it's all fluffy, 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 and then it hits hard pan. So I might consider... Um, picking the spot where I'm going to put my raised bed. I'm going to aerate the soil. I'm probably going to put some compost on top, uh, water that in, uh, uh, and then put the cardboard down. Um, depending on what the situation is with gophers in your area, now would be the time to, excuse me, to um, line the bottoms of my raised beds with gopher wire, which is generally about quarter inch hardware cloth. Um, they call it cloth, but it's just wire on a roll. Um, so I would definitely incorporate that. You don't have to make them very tall because you're actually going to have to fill them with a significant amount of soil and compost. So generally the standard is about 12 inches, about 12 inches tall. Uh, try not to make them too wide. Usually three to four feet is usually maximum. Um, so you don't have to walk in them. You want to be able to have enough space to grab across for weeding or for harvesting, um, mostly just to give yourself access for sure. And as far as vegetables, I mean, now we're definitely moving our way into the winter. So now's the time of the year to plant um, all your brassicas. So your kale and your broccoli and your cauliflower, your collards, um, onions and garlic. It's the time of the year for that. Um, things like chard. I grow a lot of cilantro in the um in the winter time. Citrus is going to be big. Um, again, bare root fruit trees are going to be big. Uh, right now, also too, it's a great time to put in those uh, pollinator plants as well. But again, you're going to want to make sure you hydrozone them. Um, any kind of um root vegetable, your rutabaga, your radishes, your beets. Um, now's the time of the year to go ahead and, and put those in as well. And generally, um, since uh, the bulk of the plants, especially a lot of our winter crops, are mostly just leaves, um, nitrogen is going to play a really key role as far as keeping, um, keeping them kind of healthy and thriving. So generally, I will fill, um, I would fill that raised bed with soil and I would mix, of course, mix some compost into it, water it and kind of get it to settle down a little bit um, before I plant. And I generally like to plant on overcast days just because I don't want to worry about my plants kind of struggling in the sun, even in the winter sun. And then usually once I planted things, I'm going to dilute some castings in some water and then I'm going to water my plants in with that. And then that's not only going to water them in, but it's also going to provide them with some nitrogen. And generally, as long as your plant in this regard, this is for spring and summer and winter gardens, as long as your plant is not producing a flower or a fruit, you can continue um, with, the, with the nitrogen source as far as kind of fertilizing is concerned. Once everything starts to flower and fruit, it's really about providing phosphorus in order to help that. And you could use that usually with um, something like uh, bone meal, generally speaking, usually has a higher phosphorus uh, in there. Hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> yes, that was great. Mm -hmm. Regarding leaves and mulch with trees, um, Tony has a question about not wanting to have apple worms or peach leaf curl. So she was saying she tries to clean up the fallen leaves um, by the tree and that it could be a challenge if there's mulch already there. Do you have any suggestions of kind of reduce um, how to prevent those those issues? Well, I mean, if you do have peach leaf curl, I mean, mulch is going to be, it's going to be super important. So it's going to especially just be a question of 
basically collecting the fallen leaves and any of the spent fruit that's come down onto the mulch. I mean, I'm always going to want to say mulch, but um, you will definitely still have to do that. It will just be a, a, a collection of just of collecting it because I still think mulch has a role to play as far as the tree is concerned. Okay, we have a couple of questions about animals and insects, how to deter them without harming the plants, and any suggestions for edibles to control squirrels. Um, they're eating tomatoes, cucumbers, et cetera. They have an issue with squirrels. Yeah, we all have an issue with squirrels. Um, right now, uh, at least as far as, because I, like I said, I grow everything in containers. So my deal with the squirrels and the cats these days, I have been um, putting um, old takeout chopsticks, wooden chopsticks, and I've been basically placing them around my plants. And if it's an empty container, I just fill the container with it. Um, it's I'm finding it to be a really good deterrent because not only can they not climb in there um, and they can't dig. So that I've been finding that is a good deterrent. If you don't have chopsticks, you can use, you know, plastic forks or someone told me one time they use bamboo skewers with the points up. Um, that's a great way to, that's how I deal with cats and squirrels. Um, and the other question was about um, protecting, um, protecting plants. What was the, I'm sorry. Yeah, how to prevent um, pests with, without hurting the plants. Well, number one, the ounce of prevention as far as keeping pests at bay is to build that healthy soil. I know I talked about it and talked about it and talked about it, but I can't I can't say it enough. Building healthy soil is going to be key. Um, if it comes to the point where that's just not enough, depending on the pests, um, if you're incorporating things like mulch, again, I'm going to say mulch is great. Uh, mulch is also the... Um, a perfect habitat for the predaceous ground beetle. It's probably half an inch in length, kind of black, opalescent, shiny. Um, they live in your mulch and they prey on snails and slugs and their eggs. Again, planting um, things to attract pollinators and beneficial insects, especially those sap suckers. Um, that's going to be another kind of key thing. Uh, and all depending on the type of pest that we're, we're, we're talking about, sometimes there's barrier methods, uh, there's traps, you know, slugs and snails, there's the old beer trap, there's things like diatomaceous earth that you could use, there are um, a variety of different ways. Uh, I always like to go to the UC Davis IPM website, I love that website for pest control, because basically they are, they're taking that hierarchy where building healthy soil, and then they give you a variety of different options with sometimes the option has to be a chemical, but then if that's the case, then they're going to recommend the least toxic chemical in order to do it. So like I said, snails and slugs, barrier methods, usually things like aphids and um, white fly or scale they generally um, have a mutualistic relationship with ants. So sometimes it's a question of being able to separate the pests from the ants. Usually with fruit trees, that's usually something like tanglefoot. Um, you're going to put that around the base, uh, around the trunk of your tree. Uh, put a piece of fabric or like an elastic bandage or something on there. You don't want to put that on the bark directly. Um, so barriers... There's non-toxic sprays that you can make out of water and dish soap and vegetable oil, um, all different types of stuff. Great. Um, regarding adding acid to the soil, we have a question if tea leaves is good for that? I mean, tea leaves would be good. It's not as much acid as, as coffee is, but the thing about tea leaves, it's going to add nitrogen which is still going to be something that's going to be key. And I saw another question about coffee. One second, just trying to find. When you go to you, oh, sorry. I think there was a question about 
um, how to add coffee to to trees and like where to where to is it where to spread the coffee grounds. Okay. Um, so for, they said they mostly put them under citrus trees. Is that okay? Yes, absolutely. I give them to my citrus trees. Actually, everybody gets it. Um, all my edibles, perennial and annual. Um, the key for coffee grounds is it's kind of thin to win. You can do thin, but you can do kind of regular applications. Um, really thick coffee grounds are going to mold like crazy. And then that mold might possibly jump on your plant. We definitely want to avoid that. So like I said, it's thin to win. So I'm going to spread it across the soil. I always, so it's like I'm making a sandwich with a piece of bread and I'm putting mustard on it. I want to see the bread underneath. I don't want it just to be all mustard. I want to be able to see it. So spread it thin, spread it wide, and then water, and then definitely water it in for sure. Um, sometimes I like to dry them. Sometimes I just go through the, um, you know, it's the end of the, we've drank it all the coffee in the coffee pot. And sometimes I'll just run the, um, I'll just keep adding water to the coffee pot and I'll just keep running it until the uh, water runs clear. And then I have a nice big bucket of just um, actual kind of weak coffee and I will use that to water as well. Great. But thin to, but thin to, thin to win is the, is the key if you're using them fresh. We have a question about how to encourage healthy worms directly in the garden. Build healthy soil, put that compost in there. Compost, compost, compost. That will bring the worms to the park because you're having food for them and they're definitely going to be looking for that and they're going to aerate it. You don't have to go out and buy worms. You don't have to do that. Just, I mean, to be honest, if you just want to do an experiment, just find a, like a bare patch of soil or, you know, water it a little bit and throw a piece of cardboard on top of it and then come back in a couple of days. There's going to be just worms right underneath the cardboard. So building healthy soil is going to be uh, super key and compost is compost and mulch are, the, are those things. Great. Um, Jane has a question about what can be used instead of two to three inch wood pieces for coarse mulch. She lives on a former orchard, so there's lots of termites. Instead of instead of that mulch? Yeah, instead of wood pieces, what, what is a different alternative for, for coarse mulch? Oh, I mean, wood, I mean, really wood is the only alternative for, for coarse mulch. I mean, that's it. It's just depending, depending on the piece size. The only thing that I know that's extra special, it's kind of hard to get, but, um, but yeah, any coarse mulch is going to be most likely a ch is, is going to be chipped up, chipped up wood. Anything else would be fine mulch, but that is not going to be, um, that's only really good for uh, fleshy annuals, not so much for heavy perennials, for woody perennials. Okay, we're getting through these. Um, going back to biointensive planting, how close do you plant the plants? Okay, so um, you're still gonna follow along with the with the instructions that come along on the seed packet. So let's just say we're doing a bed. I'm going to do cherry tomatoes. I'm going to do basil and I'm gonna do carrots. So I'm gonna do a tomato plant, and then 18 inches from there, I'm gonna do another tomato plant. And then from 18 inches from both of those, bam, I'm gonna do another tomato plant. And in the empty space, I'm going to, well, probably I'll probably do carrots in the empty space. Those, I'll put an inch apart. And then the basil, I'll most likely hang along the edge of it so that can it can hang out of the raised bed or container or whatever, and then just do that along the edge. And then I'll just go hard on that for sure. And then if you train your tomato plants and everybody's able to get sun, carrots need their soil to be warm in order to germinate. And then as everything kind of transitions out, then now as my carrots are starting to mature, my basil's already going, my plants, are, my tomato plants are starting to die. 
I can cut back the tomato plants and it's going to give the uh, the carrots an opportunity. And then I'm just going to follow that up with whatever else I'm going to be planting. I'm going to be planting next. So feel free to just go, you know, you could do a deeper planting, but it's really about interplanting too. Great. Um, we have a question about some good resource, if there's any good resources you suggest for how to plan and lay down drip irrigation for a beginner. Um, well, sure. I mean, definitely if you're a beginner and you want to convert, I definitely would try to get one of those conversion kits. I've only ever seen them at Urban Farmer. I haven't seen them at, um, at Ewing or any other kind of irrigation store. So I would definitely check and see if um, I would definitely check with that. That is total beginner. Um, and then, like I said, once you have a base from which to start, then you can just work that off. And generally, most of the tubing that comes um, basically is going to be, uh, your main tubing is going to be at a half an inch. And then you can work off of that, whether you can put emitters directly into the half an inch or you can put um, tubing connected to the half an inch. And generally, you'll just need, you know, blank tubing for areas that are not going to be irrigated. Um, like I said, if you decide to do kind of basic tubing, but it's really about a lot of, the, um, sometimes irrigation can be a lot of trial and error, uh, and don't discount hand watering, to be honest, you can be just as efficient as a hand water as you can with a, um, having a drip irrigation, mostly because you can figure out whether or not your plants actually need to be watered. Um, I like to use a moisture meter for that. Like I said, I grow everything in containers. So if, you know, I know things have to be watered, but everything works differently. Like right now, my fruit trees, my citrus trees are totally um, producing fruit right now and they cannot get enough water. But, you know, my, you know, my, my sugar snap peas are just kind of chilling. So I'll go around to each container and I'll test it and see, you know, what state they are. Is it dry? Is it moist? Is it damp? That's basically the three indicators on my moisture meter. And I will do that. It is actually very, very, very easy, um, believe it or not. Like I said, making sure that you have connectors um, and that if you're doing things on main lines, especially if you're connecting things to like your PVC, um, always making sure that you have a Teflon tape to do it. Great. And I would just add that there's been um, several Bosca classes focused solely on irrigation as well. Oh, if sweet. You go to, if you go to the Bosco website under the recording, um, that's probably a good resource to, to start as well to learn about the yeah. your um, setting, doing drip. And that's a good topic for us maybe at Palo Alto to do in the future. But I know other agencies have, have done that on, um, and the recordings are available. Okay, how often should we... Talked about this a little bit, but if we're thinking of having a garden with sheet mulching and drip irrigation, how often is fertilized or needed and what is the best way to apply it? Well, I guess the question is, um, again, like if you're doing like a, a nitrogen fertilizer, you're only going to want to do that while the plant is mostly just leaves and stems. And that includes all your fruit trees as well. So before they start to bloom, before they start to set fruit, anything, you're going to want to definitely fertilize it. So in containers, you're not going to have to, you're going to have to fertilize and amend a lot more often than if you are growing uh, in the ground. So if I'm growing, uh, if I'm growing up a lovely little, say I'm doing uh, kale and onions together. Those are great companion plants. I can grow all my lettuce, I can grow kale and chard. I can grow those along all my onion family plants. And I'll probably do that bio-intensive um, as well. So I'm going to mostly, I'm not going to worry too much about the onions, but I'm mostly going to want to focus on making sure that there is a fair amount of nitrogen to support any of the leafy greens that I'm going to go ahead and give them. So again, I'm going to give them some sort of nitrogen source at the beginning when I put them in. And then depending on how well they're doing or not doing, they might get a they might get another application, you know, another month or another couple of months after afterwards. 
Uh, spring and summer ones have a tendency to be a little quicker because it goes straight from nitrogen and then I'm switching over to phosphorus. Um, and then really all depends on what's happening with your 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 plant as well. So this year we have um, we got all that rain and it really affected my citrus plants. I ended up with a potassium deficiency. My leaves were curled and the ends of the leaves were all brown and crispy. Uh, I ended up with an iron deficiency. My leaves were yellow, except for the ribs, except for the veins were all bright green. So in that instance, um, I needed to bring in some iron and some potassium. So I actually went out and got a citrus mix in order to correct that. And in my container, I've probably given it citrus mix at least um, at least once or twice Uh uh, in the past few months. So your plant's always going to tell you kind of what it needs. Sometimes when a plant's stressed out, you don't want to mess with it too much. But if it's starting to, you know, change and have some sort of um, mostly a deficiency, um, then yeah, then I would definitely interject. So I've used citrus mix on my uh, citrus plants. I've used acid mix as well. I also like a citrus mix because it does contain iron. Um as opposed to just using like a regular kind of iron. Great. We have a question about if you could talk a little bit about permaculture. Oh, sure. Uh, it's two words, basically. It's permanent uh, agriculture. So sheet mulching is part of it. Um, things like food forests. Basically, you're, you're creating come, um, you're setting up long-term kind of working with nature systems in your um uh, on in your landscape so utilizing the materials that you currently have on site for mulching or for composting um you know and a lot of building things like herb spirals or growing like food forests where you're going to grow in different types of you know layers you're going to have maybe a mushroom layer and then you're going to have an herb layer and you're going to have a shrub layer which is maybe like berries and a fruit tree layer and then maybe like a big tree that's going to kind of cover everything and all the kind of things that kind of come along with it but basically it's working with nature um not a lot of inputs We have a question on the brand of citric mix that you use. This person also has issues with the lemon tree. I am loving down to earth. They come in just a simple brown box with a little bit of, you know, a little bit of coloring on it. I like that one specifically because the iron is more of a natural iron. When I was searching for an iron substitute, it was, it was a lot of chemicals was a lot of chemicals and I've had really great success with that. It really brought back my lime tree still a little bit acting up, but my lemon tree um, is right back on track. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, what edibles would you be planting in a raised garden this month? Well, I will be planting. Um, I'm going to be doing carrots and radishes and beets and then um, I got some broccoli rob that I will be doing by seed and probably just like kale, chard, onions, um, definitely lots of cilantro. I'm hoping to add a apple tree, a dwarf or miniature apple tree into the mix when um, bare root tree, uh, fruit season comes. Okay. Helen wants to know, what do you recommend for containing the huge growth of squash plants for biointensive planting? Oh, to contain them? Well, you can trellis them. Nice thing about um, squash is you can actually do squash vertical. So you could do a trellis. A lot of people like to do, um, like, uh, imagine that this is my raised bed. Right. And then someone's going to do like a kind of like an angle. So mostly it's like like a piece of wood. Maybe it has some sort of mesh on it. You know, it's just kind of like a board um, that digs into the ground. And I'm going to plant my squash and my squash is going to grow over the top of it. And then underneath in that bare area, because it's going to be mostly shaded now, 
I might just put some like cilantro or some peas or um, maybe like some bush beans or something, something underneath there that doesn't require too much or some spinach or something that doesn't require too much sunshine. I've also seen where they've literally just kind of pulled it up like a ponytail and kind of trimmed it. And then now it kind of grows like a tree. You have a lot of options as far as space is concerned. But I might not even put squash in a raised bed just for the fact that it would take over. For me, I might probably just put that out in the open and then plant it and just allow it to kind of go over my mulch or whatever. Um, I see our, our last question here is from Katie Seed versus Seedling. Um, she had a success of 50% with the plant spot at a local store. Oh, well, that's a shame. Um, for fall and winter crops, I just broadcast seeds. I don't do, I don't do starts for, for winter crops. For spring and summer crops, I will propagate my own via seed. I, I love doing that. Um, I guess I would have to ask the question of what was going on with the, with the 50%. Um, can I ask? Um, sorry, Katie, can I ask if um, these plants were uh, tomatoes and hot peppers? Because if that's the case, then we all had a horrible, horrible tomato and pepper. Um, my, uh, my peppers are just coming now. Yeah, this is Katie. So it was a hot pepper. I just pulled it actually because it was just uh, not doing anything interesting. <laughs> yeah. And then I had uh, jalapeno. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and it's another one I didn't. I don't remember exactly what that was. The uh, eggplant was doing well, but it's pretty small. But I haven't been watering. That's my my concern because I don't want to water too much, but I'm not watering enough. I think. No, 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 no. The problem, <laughs> the problem with this year was. Generally, peppers, they need temperatures, a consistent long temperatures of at least 70 to 80 degrees, if not higher, um, throughout their growing period. The problem with our summer is our, our mornings were way too cold. We had really cold mornings for summertime. And then our hottest part of the day is usually between two and like five. And then after five, the temperature drops off. So we went from originally to a six to eight hour hot period before to like a three to four hot period. And then, then the fog would come in like around five and then that would be it. So we had very truncated days. So unless you were like in Livermore or Fremont, I was just somewhere today. We're in Oakland. They're just, their tomatoes are just now ripening. So yeah, it was, a, it was just a horrible horrible thing. So I always think if this is going to be kind of the trend, um, then I would say uh, try to find sources. There's a lot of great plants. There's San Francisco Fog. Um, I think this one I just discovered, I think it's called Pink Madonna. Uh, both of those are tomato varieties that do relatively well in cooler climates. And then always check out and see what... Um, uh, Pam Pierce has to say, um, she wrote the um, the book for here. It's called Golden Gate Gardening. So basically, she covers that whole the whole idea that there's so many microclimates here in the Bay Area that it's kind of hard to you know narrow them down. And she does make plant recommendations for for cooler climates too. Hope that helps, Katie. And it wasn't you, it was just bad weather. <laughs> I see a new question just popped up. Um, there's a shady spot in the garden that they're struggling to grow plants in. Any recommendations on what edibles would, would thrive in the, the shade? Well, the nice thing about it is um, you can do, in most kind of shade loving edibles only really need about, is it filtered sun or is it just like, really sh really shady because you could do a lot of um cold weather crops in in shady gardens you could always grow up like a really great amount of cilantro if you're really into cilantro um you could do easily things like kale and chard 
you do have options. And don't be afraid to and don't be afraid to experiment a little bit too. Please take into consideration that usually there's a lot of requirements like shade lovings two to three, kind of semi shades three to four, full suns like six to eight. But you also have to take into consideration what the microclimate is of your landscape. You know, my backyard is on the good summer day is at least 10 to 15 degrees hotter than my front yard because my backyard's all paved, narrow, so the house is close by and there's a six foot wooden fence. So taking this to some, sometimes heat can be also be your friend, even if you can't, um, if you can't do it with the sun. I do want to recognize that we're at 835. We're happy to stay on a little longer, but if anyone does need to hop off, this is being recorded and we will send the recording out. Um, feel free to put any other questions for the next couple of minutes in the Q&A or raise your hand and you can ask Lori directly. I do see there's a couple shout outs, Lori, that um, someone had learned oh. from you sheet mulching years ago and it worked and learned how to make compost from you too and keeping the pile moist, moist was very important. So just some, some thank yous there to Lori. Oh, <laughs> thank you, anonymous attendee. <laughs> At first, I thought it might be my mom, but no, dying. Front, my mom doesn't have dying grass yard. I'm glad I could. I'm glad I could help. <clears throat> I'll give it another minute or so. Um. Oh, Mindy's asking you to repeat how to deter gophers. Oh, um, <clears throat> if you're planting in raised beds, um, definitely you're going to want to make sure that you're going to line the bottom of it with a hardware cloth. Um, like a quarter inch wire cloth that comes in a roll and if you can lay it out and set your raised bed on top of it or you can just line it like a coffee filter line on the bottom attach it a little bit to the sides um, the idea being that they might still want to nibble on the roots but they're not going to be able to chuck the whole thing down and if you're planting individual plants and you're having consider consider um putting your um the roots of your plants in a gopher cage as well and those come in a variety of different sizes or you can make your own but if they're yeah gophers have really really taken over over the past few years people a lot of people are having a lot more problems with them so yeah just trying to deter them that's going to be kind of super key Um, anyone else have any other questions for Lori? We do still have 24 for people on the webinar. Feel free to put it in the Q&A or raise your hand. Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, there's a question. Oh, uh, we got a, a thank you from... Oh, Diana. right on. <laughs> you are welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks for all the great questions. Great. I appreciate well, it. I'm not seeing any other questions, but yes, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you so much, Lori, for this great talk tonight. We will be sending out the link to the recording and Lori, is okay if we include your contact information? Absolutely questions that, that come up later on that's fine i also have a couple of handouts that i can email to you glinda if you don't mind passing that uh, passing that along yeah if you could send those we can definitely um yeah absolutely i'll do that i'll do that today great well thank you everyone thank you Lori. have a good night and hope to see you all at future workshops yes y'all take care now thank you so much